So again, today we're in for a treat uh, where Dr. Eric Carlisle is going to talk to us about data analytics and health disparities. Dr. Carlisle's work focuses on developing and applying innovative data analytic approaches to understanding disease prevent progression and how to present it. While at the NIH as a postdoc and beyond, he developed bioinformatic tools for analyzing gene expression data in prostate cancer and Parkinson's disease. Later, while at Northrop Grumman Health, he developed a prototype for near real-time analysis of integrated genomic and electronic health record data in the cloud. And this later led to the development of a prototype precision oncology analytics platform that predicted tumor stage and health outcome in neuroblastoma patients. Dr. Carlisle is the CEO of the National Alliance Against Disparities in Patient Health, otherwise known as NADPH, which is a national nonprofit that leverages advanced computational and data science technologies, such as artificial intelligence and machine learning, in support of its mission to eliminate health disparities and improve health equity in marginalized and under resource communities. He's also the lead MPI of AMAHED's Infrastructure Corps. AMAHED stands is the National Institute of Health Artificial Intelligence Machine Learning Consortium that is advancing health equity and researcher diversity. As the lead of the Infrastructure Corps, Dr. Carlisle works on efforts to enhance accessing data, computing, and software infrastructure infrastructure to facilitate both AI, ML, and health disparities research. He earned his bachelor's degree uh, from, in biology from Fisk University, and he earned his PhD in biochemistry and molecular biology from the Howard University College of Medicine, and then went on and did some postdoctoral work at NIH. And we're in for a treat today as he's going to share with us on how the AMAHEAD Infrastructure Corps is advancing technological solutions for underrepresented minorities. Uh, Dr. Carla. Thank you so much, Dr. Washington. What a wonderful introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, you know, again, I, you, you've heard me say on numerous occasions, just, you know, how excited I am and, and proud of the work that's going on down there and how you're engaging with these students, the, uh, the testimonials and uh, the commentary that the students gave uh, at the beginning of the seminar was just really impressive. Uh, and, and I'm just excited to see the very good activation in this space uh, because we need it. And, um, and kudos to you and please uh, continue success uh, with, with this good work that you're doing here. Um, so welcome all, thank you for having me. Uh, so yeah, I am, I think you've you know, gotten a good overview of my background and uh, I'm going to talk a bit, uh, really focus this on, on NADPH and what we're doing in the space of uh, data, data technologies to uh, address health disparities and improve health outcome. Uh, much of that work is being focused uh, through the AIM Ahead program. And so I'm gonna be talking about that and how we're working with the NIH and other uh, academic uh, industrial and nonprofit stakeholders to really help build capacity uh, and boost representation in this very critical field, which is driving uh, innovation around technology uh, and, and certainly having a tremendous impact uh, on global economy. And so it's very important to make sure that we have equity and representation in this space. Uh, and that's very critical. So uh, on that note, uh, I will share my screen and go through uh, a presentation that I prepared for you. Okay, so again, I, I wanted to really you know, NADPH is, you know, while the principles have been around for, uh, you know, quite some time, and, and, and we've got a very se senior and experienced uh, group of folks that are working to build this effort and try to have this impact uh, as a nonprofit uh, instantiation, uh, you know, we're about, you know, six years old. Uh, and so while we've come to grow in this space and really be recognized as the national thought leader, uh, around uh, health disparities uh, and certainly uh, uh, increasingly data science and data technologies, you know, understanding that in certain pockets, folks might not be familiar with who we are. So I certainly wanted to give an overview of NADPH and, and, and who we are and why we're in this space and, and feel like we can help make an impact. Um, so uh, first and foremost, you know, NADPH is a nonprofit 
Uh, you know, I like to think of us first as a, a health research corporation, because uh, we are a nonprofit non corporation, uh, and, and, and we're really born out of research and technology development and trying to use that to bridge the gap in access to precision-based healthcare to address health disparities. So much of health disparities is really born um, uh, in, in communities that are under-resourced, uh, marginalized, uh, and, and certainly underrepresented. And, and, and unfortunately, uh, in terms of access to health care, um, that, that, that access is, is, is not always the best, as, as, as most are acutely aware. Uh, and so how do we uh, uh, help uh, accelerate uh, you know, and, and, and maximize around the, the advances in technology and, and, and scientific discovery that are helping to improve, revolutionize, and improve healthcare delivery, how do we really get that to those communities? And so that's really why NADPH was formed. And we, and we do that through, uh, as I mentioned, research and technology development and implementation, uh, community uh, health outreach, uh, advocacy, uh, and thought leadership, uh, and, and then also around two critical areas that uh, are not always intuitively obvious, but the data is, is really unequivocal in terms of their impact uh, on health outcomes and helping to help reduce health disparities. And that's around education and, and training. And so we're very active uh, in trying to use uh, health science and STEM as constructs for um, uh, delivering training, again, and, and that is a, a, a facilitator of workforce development. So that's, that's who we are at NADPH. And, and as you know, you can imagine, based on the things that have been said, you know, we're, we're highly focused on uh, using uh, data technology, so advanced computational uh, and data sciences to uh, affect that mission. Um, so, what are health disparities, and why address them? So, uh, you know, just you know, looking at some definitions that are are sort of standardized uh, across the, the health space. Health disparities are really just um, you know, differential outcomes uh, in, in health that are preventable, right? Uh, and so uh, what we have seen historically is that the burden of, of this disparity in health outcome is really uh, borne by communities that uh, are comprised of, you know, racial minorities, poor rural populations. And, and that's really where the, where, where the real burden of the health disparity uh, exists within, uh, you know, certainly the U.S. and and, and really globally, uh, and then, you know, what's in addition to the moral uh, aspect of this, obviously, you know, uh, we 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 don't want to see, uh, you know, the humanity in us does not want to see uh, any group uh, unnecessarily suffer. So that's the moral uh, piece of the story, uh, but you know, as we like to speak to, because that doesn't always resonate with everyone. Uh, and it's like, hey, it's not affecting me, why bother? But the reality is, is, is and we say this all the time, that this is really a national and, and, and really a global crisis. And, 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 and you know, a large reason for that is, is economic. And, and so just in the U.S. alone, we can see that health disparities account for over, over a quarter of a trillion dollars uh, in terms of um, health economic burden in the U.S. alone. And so that really means that as a, as a, um, as, as a nation, you know, and certainly as a healthcare system, that that's unsustainable. And this is why we see tremendous activation across uh, a broad stakeholder community to try and address these health disparities. So this is a very critical area. And then as we're seeing across uh, all sectors and, and areas of, of society, uh, you know, we're understanding that uh, this tremendous power in data, and if we can leverage that to be more precise um, in, in how we develop models uh, to make sure that those things are accurate, those models are, are highly robust and accurate, but also too, and, and you'll hear me address this in the talk, uh, to make sure that they are um, equitable and, and minimized with respect to bias so that we can maximize uh, that, that positive effect and minimize the risk uh, 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 to communities that are, are most vulnerable. So um, this is what they are and why it's really important to address them. Um, so at NADPH, we've been really active with a number of stake stakeholders at a national level, um, working with foundations like Robert Wood Johnson and others to, uh, to really understand, uh, you know, the data and, 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 and just as importantly, the technologies, the platforms that these data reside in, right, and how, how this data 
uh, is being procured uh, to understand the impact that they have on the communities uh, that they're being uh, that, uh, you know, extracted from and, and, and that these technologies are being uh, implemented or applied to. And that's very critical. So this is a very um, uh, fast growing field, a lot of acceleration. Um, and, and what we see is just a push, you know, because, um, um, you know, intuitively and anecdotally, we can see the power of this technology. Right, and we want to get to the value, and sometimes in that rush to get the value, oftentimes, quite frankly, you know, we're not always cognizant of the risk, right? And so it's really incumbent upon us to make sure that uh, we do our due diligence and and appropriately evaluate these these uh, technologies and and do that in a very uh, patient centric, right, um, user centric uh, standpoint. And so for us at NADPH, that really means interacting with uh, the community and, 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 and persons with lived experience, as it's often referred to, to, to get their take on this and their feed, feedback from a technology development perspective. You know, uh, you know, most are familiar with this. It's really just called gathering critical input requirements, right, which are crucial to making sure that whatever you design from a technology perspective has value to the end user. And so we see it very simply as apt. And so we've been very active in this space. This is a project uh, that we completed with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and some other data stakeholders uh, to really evaluate, as I said, uh, community data and, and, and data systems uh, to understand their impact and, and perceived value within these communities. Um, and, and this is, you know, we've published on this work as well and presented on this. Uh, and so uh, you can cite this work and, and, and learn more about it, or feel free to reach out to me. But this is critical work, and this should be at the forefront of any type of work that's involving uh, developing uh, 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 data systems, data models, uh, particularly within uh, you know, marginalized communities. Um, so this is just a, a, a graph of some of the work that we did. And, and, and you know, then uh, if we're looking at developing uh, principles of good principles of equity, uh, around data, uh, these are just some of the best practices uh, that, you know, there's consensus around communities that are thinking that way, uh, a consensus about the things that one should take into account when evaluating the, the, uh, the interaction of communities with data, assessing how that risk uh, should be shared, uh, and making sure that you incorporate community uh, involvement in this. And then, as I said before, really making sure that you are aware of potential biases uh, around the collection of that data uh, and certainly around um, any type of technology or, or uh, models that, that are uh, developed from that data. And, and what you see is that those, those, um, those approaches that are inclusive of persons with lived experience um, are most holding to those principles um, and, 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 and really should translate into uh, artifacts, be they models, uh, infrastructure, data repositories, and how they're being collected and curated uh, are, are going to embody, uh, do a better job of embodying those best practices uh, and principles to maximize uh, equity and minimize bias. Uh, and so again, this is just some of the work that we did with Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to show to show some of that. Um, and so we are, there we go, uh, also working with CDC, uh, along with the CDC Foundation and Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to evaluate some of the data sources that are out in federal healthcare space. And so, um, for example, CDC places. And so these are data repositories that are used, quite frankly, to inform decisions around policy, um, strategies around community health, but it's very important to make sure that as those data resources are, are created and, 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 and the analyses of those data and those uh, analytic outputs are, are generated, you know, that they're being done in a manner, as I said, that are inclusive of the communities that they're, they're, they're interacting with. Uh, and so this is, I'm happy to see this happening now, that there is uh, tremendous uh, rec uh, recognition of, of the importance of this type of approach. And we're seeing this effort now uh, being incorporated into uh, you know, these types of projects or initiatives that are centered around data. And so very important. So I wanted to highlight that uh, again, because it's easy to 
sort of get enamored with the technology and, and, and getting access to it, but we wanna make sure that the technology and the resources you know, are, are robust, right? But again, are going to have broad-based value and in a manner that maximizes that value, minimizes that risk. So, so for NADPA, so this is the type of approach that we have taken uh, in, in trying to develop technologies to help us uh, do a better job of, of you know, predicting uh, risk for um, you know, chronic diseases and things that really drive health disparities and, and, and then being able to apply those things to uh, reduce those health disparities and improve outcome. Uh, and so again, it's important that you know, as we work to get to something like this, uh, which we've been building, that we take those approaches that I just talked about. Um, so in any event, so for us, what that means in terms of predictive analytics and health disparities, well, for those of us in the field, uh, you know, I think what we have come to realize is, I mean, there's a mac, you know, a maxim, you know, more de more data is better data, um, you know, to an extent, and 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 for the most part, that tends to be true. Um, we have seen a shift in healthcare practice from uh, more pay for service to a model and 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 sort of uh, a one size fits all approach to healthcare to then in a very data-driven way as our ability to generate more data, but more importantly, uh, apply big data uh, technologies uh, uh, and machine learning uh, and other artificial intelligence-based approaches to uh, enable more robust analysis of that data so that we can identify uh, more discrete subpopulations. And so what does that mean? It means that uh, our view around a particular area of health or disease goes from a macro view to something where we can now say, hey, <clears throat> um, I can look at that uh, global population and now see discrete differences that allow me to stratify that population you know, into subpopulations. And that has profound repercussions uh, in terms of diagnoses and treatment. Uh, and, and, and most often, what that does is allow us to be more precise uh, in, in, in that diagnosis and treatment and, and the resources, right, that are allotted to addressing those are, 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 are used uh, and applied more effectively and more efficiently um, and more efficacious. And so the outcome uh, improves and the adverse event or the risk reduced. And so that's been a, a, a big uh, revolution in healthcare that's been very uh, much driven uh, very much so driven by uh, the power of data uh, and data technologies. And so, so then what you see then, once we come to that realization, you know, and we actually can see improvement in the performance of models by including more data uh, that you know, comes from that um, broader ecology of healthcare exposures that a patient might experience, is that th those models get more, more robust uh, and their predictive power improves. Uh, and so now, again, there's this push to capture as much data as possible uh, within the human or patient ecosystem, right? And, and not uh, make rely on assumptions about what is truly impactful in terms of a health outcome perspective. So for us, you know, um, we see that as uh, really trying to create a new, more clinical, biological, socio-ecological model uh, that can be uh, you know, more powerful in informing, in, in informing uh, decisions about health. And so we've been working with, with members within the community to kind of construct some data technologies, some data platforms that would give that power to them to be able to take control over that, uh, you know, that vast array of information that spans uh, their ecosystem of healthcare exposure or interaction within the healthcare system um, and, and, and bring that together in an integrated fashion and, and then certainly be able to see things in a more visually intuitive way, uh, but then us working with them on uh, you know, in some analytic capacity to present that information in a manner that is more beneficial to them and, and helpful in navigating their, their, their own sort of um, health terrain and, and making better decisions uh, in partnership with their health 
with their health care providers. So that's, um, I just wanted to put some of this into context that people often understand, don't understand why we're in the space and what it is that we're really trying to do. And so, um, and so, and again, and, and this really speaks to the need to create longitudinally or, or prospectively a different type of data resource, right? And so we look at the electronic health record, that's a very narrow view of a patient's exposure or, or, or the things that impact you know, patient's health or health measurements. Um, and, and so we certainly need to look at expanding that um, in terms of the types of data that are included in the electronic health record, or at least are also factored into uh, models that we use, algorithms and models that we use to make decisions about health. And so we're, we're working with others to try and certainly continue to demonstrate and validate proof of concept of that, um, and then you know advocate uh, and create the rationale for I guess a next generation health data model and certainly uh, health record systems. So um, so that's that's some of the work that we've been trying to do. So let me jump into aim ahead, and and so that stuff that I talked about that we've been doing at NADPH. Um, and again, with a thrust on making those types of resources available to underserved, under-resourced communities. Um, uh, so then from an institutional standpoint, and most of the audience uh, should, should be aware of that here, uh, you know, that includes certainly HBCUs and other my, true minority serving institutions who in their charter and their mission uh, really um, are charged with you know, again, trying to address these health disparities, you know, health and other um, inequities within these, these underserved, under-resourced, marginalized communities. So for us, Aim Ahead was really just an extension of things that we saw that we were trying to do. And, and we saw that, hey, this was something that we really, you know, needed to be involved in. So what is Aim Ahead? So that uh, stands for Artificial Intelligence Machine Learning Consortium to Advance Health Equity and Research and Diversity. And that's what AIM AHEAD stands for. Uh, and so it really is a, a part of a broader national strategy, which is essentially saying, hey, um, we need to uh, certainly get stronger in our abilities as, you know, here in the US uh, to develop artificial intelligence uh, and, and, and other advanced uh, computational technologies. And this talent, uh, all over uh, across the uh, U.S. And that, that talent certainly is not sovereign to uh, some of the more hollow institutions like Harvard or Stanford, but certainly exists within the Morehouses and, and, the, and, and the Meharis and, uh, of the world and the Howards. And, and to truly be uh, at our best in terms of being competitive uh, as a nation, we really need to cultivate that talent as well. And, and we need to have programs that really enrich um, in, in, those, in those communities. And so AIM AHEAD is just one example um, with a particular focus on health disparities and, and building the capacity to apply that artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, capabilities to health disparities. So that's AIM AHEAD. And uh, I'll tell you that the long-term goals of, of AIM AHEAD, uh, as we came together to, to really say, hey, you know, what are the things that we would hope to be uh, or see as outcomes? You know, well, well, four sort of North Stars emerge from that. You know, one is to develop a diverse, equitable, and inclusive uh, AI in our workforce. The other is to increase knowledge, awareness, uh, and national scale community engagement and empowerment in AI ML. Uh, the third was to use this technology to address uh, health disparities and, and improve minority health. Uh, and you know, looking at three areas of health that bear high burdens of, of health disparity, uh, and those being behavioral health, uh, cardiometabolic health, which is very broad and can encompass everything from, uh, you know, stroke, you know, heart disease, um, diabetes, kidney failure, uh, and so that was a, a very um, uh, that was an attempt to take a broad-based approach to some of the uh, real pain points in chronic disease that are driving health disparities. And then, and then in, in cancer, which uh, you know, by some accounts, depending on your view, when it becomes manageable, is is you know becoming to be considered as as a chronic disease in some instances. So, um, and then 
Lastly, to really build community capacity and infrastructure in AI and ML, to address community-centric health disparities and minority health. So those are the long-term goals of Aim Ahead. Uh, and so just to give you a look at some of the structure, uh, and so the, the program was first started uh, you know, on a coordinating center, which is composed of four uh, cores, at the, the leadership and administrative core, the data and research core, the data science training core, and then the infrastructure core, which is led by NADPH, as, as you've heard. Uh, and so uh, in, in forming that coordinating center, our, our, our role is really to create a broader consortium and, and engage with stakeholders across various sectors, but then really bring in folks from the extramural uh, you know, and, and, and the community level to, to put that all together and create a very rich collaborative environment to help inform um, and, and apply these things that are being developed in, in Aim Ahead. So um, I think I'll skip this. This is just basically, you know, sh showing, you know, and this you, you, I think is intuitively obvious, the, uh, the ways that uh, the three scientific and technical cores are interacting, as you can imagine. Um, and, and so I'll, I'll bypass that. And I'll, I'll get into uh, some of the work that's being done in the infrastructure core. And so, um, so when we set out uh, to start this program within the infrastructure core, as I said, NADPH was awarded that and is the lead uh, organization for that. Uh, we, we started out with a bunch of academic partners um, and they're reflected right here. Um, I wanna just acknowledge, again, the tremendous leadership and, and talent and support that I've, I've had at my disposal to help move, move the infrastructure core forward. Um, so uh, I'm the lead PI, but I am supported by two other MPIs, uh, Brad, Dr. Brad Mellon at Vanderbilt University Medical Center and Dr. Paul Aviak at Harvard Medical School. Uh, and then you can see um, some of the other uh, participants in the infrastructure core. And, and these are all sub-awardees to NADPH. Uh, and so uh, again, as you can see, a very talented, robust team uh, to really help move this infrastructure core forward. Um, so I, I just wanted to point out, this is just one of the products that is currently, uh, and so I wanted to, you know, to really just share about this because this is something that's actually up and running now from an infrastructure core perspective. Uh, this was uh, a pre-existing technology that we were able to use, and this is this is uh, uh, a platform from Harvard Medical uh, School, and they are providing this to support Aim Ahead currently, and it's supporting the research fellowship program and some of the pilot pro projects. And so you can access this now. Um, at the end, uh, I'm going to give you directions for how you can enroll into Aim Ahead and become a member uh, through Aim Ahead Connect. Um, and once you do that, you'll actually be able to leverage this. Um, but I'd like to go on and then talk about a different approach that we felt was really important. So this is an example of existing technology. And as you heard me say before, you know, a lot of the technology that was developed uh, did, did not necessarily take that approach in terms of really engaging with communities to the extent that we describe to really maximize that value and ensure that uh, you know biases and other potential uh, risk factors were reduced. And so we saw this as an opportunity in particular for NADPH to employ some of the ways we've been going about uh, engineering technology to bring that to aim ahead. So one of the things that we first started to do is to really organize within the infrastructure core into working groups um, to really uh, engage with uh, the extramural community uh, and, and you know, HBCUs, MSIs, uh, other nonprofit organizations uh, to really get that input uh, from them, boots on the ground or these persons with lived experiences. So we created very uh, dedicated uh, working groups that coalesced around some of these things, around policy, governance, ethics and equity, uh, and then with a sp specific focus around HBCU and MSIs, because we view that community as, uh, you know, one, that the spirit of much of these initiatives around building capacity and data science is speaking to. So we wanted to make sure that we were aligned with that. Um, and then, um, you know, in, in doing this work, we really started to uh, engage with them and try in trying to develop uh, real, a real policy framework uh, around AI um, ethics and equity. Uh, and so I'll, I'll just breeze through this because I'll touch on this a little bit later as well. Um, I just wanted to point out here that a part of this work 
which was really important, was to make sure that we just did the very uh, necessary uh, foundational work around a qualitative assessment. So we set out uh, and working with the other members of the uh, coordinating center, AIM Ahead Coordinating Center, to develop a survey, right? To really assess uh, AI ML capacity uh, in a variety of ways uh, in the stakeholder community, right? And then beyond that, we went on ahead and conducted some interviews uh, to really understand, again, you know, what they were working with, uh, what it is that they want to do with AI and ML. One of the things that we learned was that, hey, there was a real need to, uh, as some of the stakeholders told us, demystify what AI and ML is, because it means certain things to certain folks, right? And so to really have an understanding of AI and what it could do, some of the potential risks, you know, we found that we really need to slow down and put some effort and have that dialogue. Um, so what wound up happening is that we started to build out this consortium, this HBCU MSI consortium, um, and I think now we're at um, maybe close to 30. Uh, again, HBCUs, MSIs, we've got some healthcare clinics and small, small healthcare systems. Uh, I think maybe one not so small uh, where we're engaging with them. But more importantly, we're actually working with them to inform uh, the design of infrastructure and, and the tools to support them and, and, and working with them directly uh, and putting all of that that stuff together so it can be used in a manner that really meets them where they're at uh, and, and, and they really, uh, they can navigate that. One of the things that has really become obvious, uh, you know, in, in speaking with leadership uh, at the NIH and other places is that, you know, while we made this investment around data resources and technologies, um, it, the, the value is focused, uh, it's a little bit too narrow and it's focused at a, at a level that requires uh, a higher degree of subject matter expertise uh, than, than is resident or intrinsic within the broader community. And, and that's a mistake, you know, um, at the very least, these are federal dollars uh, and, you know, again, public dollars, and uh, we need to have a broader value proposition. So to do that, we wanna make sure that we interact with the broader community to get their take on that. So in doing that, you know, we, as I said, we did these interviews and we really captured um, very detailed information from, about, from them about their interaction with data, uh, artificial intelligence and, and machine learning resources uh, and what it is that they wanted to do. And from there, we started to create these personas. And what we began to realize is that, you know, as, as we expected, it is a, it, it's not a monolithic community. And so just because you're from an HBCU doesn't necessarily mean that you're starting out at the same level of resource or what you want to do with AI and ML is the same. And that dictates, if we're talking about building capacity, well, that dictates uh, you know, the resources that we put together to support you and how you interact with those resources. So this is a very important exercise for us, lessons learned. And out of that, we came, uh, from that, we came, uh, out of that came tools uh, that we were able to develop to help us assess uh, institutional stakeholders and, and then make some prediction about the resources that would best support them in their maturation or their capacity building process. So I just wanted to point out a couple of projects that we have around the ethics and the equity. Uh, and so we've got two, uh, one that is being uh, uh, run in partnership with Morgan State University, the other with Fisk University. And so the lead PI, PI for this is Dr. Rachel hendricks Stirrup, who is the Chief Data Governance Officer at NADPH. And at those respective universities, Morgan and Fisk, uh, the, 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 the PIs are Drs. Kim uh, Sidnor and Dr. Saeed Hussein. Uh, and so this is ongoing work. And so they are convening a network of stakeholders regionally. And so this is occurring in the Southeast region and, and then here in the Mid-Atlantic uh, region, Mid-Atlantic Northeast region, and, and they're convening those stakeholders to really gather those, uh, those inputs around what constitutes uh, a really robust, solid framework around ethics and, and equity for AI and ML. This is very critical work. And we're using that to inform the actual resources that we put together uh, to support stakeholders and aim ahead. So as we're doing this, uh, we want to make sure that we provide some access to resources. And so 
Uh, one of the data resources that, uh, and, 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 and mind you, this is not the primary role of, of our core. So as, as I indicated before, there is a data research, uh, data research core, and, and their primary role, quite frankly, is to provide data resources to support the program. However, it's it, you know, it's not always cut and dry. And, 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 and you know, um, infrastructure obviously will incorporate data resources. And at times, some of that infrastructure may be preloaded with data. And, and so it's, it's not always a, uh, again, highly demarcated process. And so this was just something that uh, as, as an organization, NADPH had already had this relationship and this resource to make available uh, in, in the infrastructure we were providing to support. And, and so we made it available to support AIM Ahead. Uh, and so we're working with stakeholders, HBCUs, MSIs, to develop use cases, leveraging this EHR data set. We're starting out with the diabetes uh, uh, cohort. And uh, again, we'll make this available in NADPH's cloud-based infrastructure for uh, AI and ML analysis. So that's something that's ongoing uh, currently within AIM Ahead. Uh, but then what I wanted to touch on, which we're really excited about, and this is, I think, very critical, and, and this is how do we work with the stakeholders directly to, to design and build all of that, right? And so we're viewing this, uh, for those of you who are familiar with software, you know, the software uh, development life, life cycle, we're applying one of those methodologies, uh, and it's, it's an agile sprint methodology where we're meeting with uh, these HBCU MSIs and other stakeholders on um, a minimum of a weekly basis to gather those critical input requirements uh, and to help them inform uh, the design. Uh, and they'll be working with us to develop. And now actually in AIM Ahead, we have a, we're, we're, we're developing a new program, Data Infrastructure Capacity Building Program, uh, which will really formally engage uh, those stakeholders in working to build uh, not only design, but build this infrastructure. Uh, and so that's re really critical. And we see that as an approach, as I said, to really minimize the risk uh, around biases um, and, and maximizing equity and, and the overall value proposition of data resources to support AI and ML, particularly to uh, support health outcomes and, and marginalize uh, underserved communities that are bearing emerging health disparities. So... Um, and again, and this is just an illustration of this right here. And so again, standard architecture, and we have those things, but 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 in each step of the way, what's re really critical uh, from uh, you know the uh, the surveys that we develop, how that data is procured, the policies around accessing that data, the user interfaces around that 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 the, those platforms in terms of how end user interacting with that data uh, to make sure that they're intuitive. And that when folks encounter this, that there's not this huge barrier uh, uh, to accessing it, you know, or or, or there's there's just not that um, that friction in terms of really um, uh, understanding the workflow, the process, right? Because that can be a huge turnoff, and we really want this to be as inviting as possible. So uh, again, this is just an illustration from an architectural standpoint of the components. But again, the important thing is that we're working with these HBCUs and MSIs to really inform all of this. Um, and so this is being designed and built um, you know, with them for them. So uh, in any event, and so from there, we want to, uh, we're working and that, what I showed there is more of a centralized cloud-based infrastructure, right? And, and, and we're gonna make that available to really democratize access. One of the things that we felt about this program is that, you know, given, you know, again, capabilities that exist in the cloud, uh, given the partnerships that we had around data access, there's no reason why we couldn't make this available to support really the entire stakeholder community. Um, you know, there's some logistics around that, obviously, but we're working through those, right? You know, we, we have the IRBs in place, you know, and, and the data use agreements. So we're looking at ways to streamline those data use agreements uh, to really make those things, you know, just a one-stop uh, process where it's just a, a sign and you're on. Uh, and so uh, to make, to really democratize this. Uh, and, and this is the power as we see it in this program uh, that uh, the NIH has put together. And, and we want to make sure that that, again, is available to, to everyone. Um, so, but in addition to that, we do recognize that there are, uh, in certain instances, 
uh, institutions. We're working with some of those where the, the data that they have access to um, really can't be shared. It can't be placed in a public cloud. Uh, and so they were working through local models uh, to, you know, to help create something that's a bit more federated where the capacity exists at, at, the, at the institutional level. And if the data use agreement changes, then they can certainly participate um, in a more centralized model. So on that note, I'm going to, because I see uh, Dr. Washington pop up, so I think I'm running out of my time. Uh, I think that was the last slide. We're going to you know, include a zero trust model where we really standardize authorization and things like that um, and, and really try and build a robust federated model. Um, this is NADPH. Here's our website. I um, encourage you to go in and uh, I think we're a little behind on some of our programs getting on the website. We're less on marketing, more on getting the work done. And so we've been scolded about that. So we're going to do a better job on that. And this is Aim Ahead Connect. And this is how you get there. And I encourage you all to register to Aim Ahead. Um, select NADPH as uh, your firm. And uh, we encourage you and invite you to be part of the community. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that engaging and informative presentation. I really enjoyed that. That was great. And I, I'm thinking now that everybody's had a chance to fill out the poll and the poll is about to close so we can see what the results are, results are for the poll. Uh, Mr. Taylor, is the poll closed? Yes, it is. Right, fantastic. So I'm just gonna read out the poll results here. And if you have a question, please feel free to put in the Q&A button. Um, so most of the attendees today are graduated or working professionals. And also for the gender, we kind of have a, a mas o menos, a, more or less a, a balance there. And um, about half of the attendees live in Georgia, half are not, and a few to our international, if you'd like to put where you're, um, coming in from, feel free to put it in the chat. And one of the questions says, of the 30 million uninsured Americans, how many are people of color? Um, what percentage are, are people of color? And so um, about 9% chose 20%, 32% chose 50%, and then 41% chose 70%. And then 18% of attendees chose 85%. And of the 30 million uninsured American, how many are people of color? 50% is the correct answer. Wow, that's high. Um, another poll question was, Black women are how much percent more likely to face mortality from breast cancer? The majority of attendees chose 42%, and that is the correct answer. Thank you for participating in our poll today. Um, with that, I'd like to ask Dr. Kyle, Car Dr. Carlisle to come back on. And if anybody has any questions, put them in the Q&A. Um, I'd like to start off with a question. This is something that's been going on that I, I haven't been able to figure out. So you're building capacity around data infrastructure. How do you define institutional capacity with respect to data, AI, ML? And how do you know, or, or how do you assess that capacity? What, what, what are the items or the fields that you're thinking about? Oh, absolutely. So yeah, it has, it has not been easy. I mean, and this has been a living document, if you would, the survey itself. Uh, and it took us you know, quite some time. But at some point you have to, you gotta let it fly, right? Or else it can just live in, in development um, in perpetuity. And so, uh, you know, we we started by, you know, fundamentally asking folks, you know, hey, what what is it that you're using? What type of tools are you using? Um, you know, what type of uh, research are you do doing? You know, um, what would you like to get out of that research? So it really was just a very broad, uh, uh, you know, survey where we did this landscape analysis of of, of stakeholders. And and really ask them, hey, you know, do you do you have um, do you have broadband access? You know, uh, I mean, what you know, what it, what are your you know cloud computing costs annually? You know, what what's your storage like? So it really, was just getting very granular around those questions. Included some site visits, right, to really see you know what the infrastructure 
look like from a physical plant standpoint. So uh, it was very comprehensive and it's always evolving. Yeah, that, that's really interesting, intricate work there. And, you know, as, a, as institutions, it would be great to almost have a guide map on what are some things that institutions could or should be thinking about so that this work of data science, AI, ML, the intersection with um, health disparities to address those challenges, you know, what, what should institutions do or have or provide, right? What, what are those golden nuggets that really make things go? Yeah, absolutely. So we will be publishing this work. Uh, and so we'll make, yeah, absolutely. And so this will be available publicly. Uh, and then again, I encourage folks to uh, look at some of the reports from the DASH survey that we did, uh, that study and, and, and the outcome from the RECO project. That was, uh, you know, some very important work. Uh, the CDC work is still ongoing. Uh, and, and then again, I'm happy to follow up with uh, anyone in the audience. Uh, to help direct to some additional resources and sort of outputs from the work that we've been involved in, as well as pointing to some others. That would be great. That would be great. Because I see that you're developing the technology in the cloud. Is that right? Or at least pointing towards that? And will yeah, that so be available? The NADPH, yeah, that's been our focus. Uh, yeah, obviously, you know, in terms of we, you know, we really uh, don't, uh, we're not built um, infrastructurally any other way. Um, however, uh, we are leading work within the infrastructure core through one of our uh, sub-awardees, and that's the University of Miami. Uh, so mm -hmm. we work very closely with them. And so actually, I'd like to acknowledge them because they're doing tremendous work locally. They're in Miami to work with uh, some uh, HBCUs, Florida Memorial University, um, as well as uh, some Hispanic serving institutions down there, Florida Atlantic and others to build local capacity uh, and bring resources um, there within the institution. And that's important as well. And that needs to happen before mm -hmm. many of these institutions can even think about participating in a federated model. So that's important. Yeah, I'd really like to see what it takes and what it is for that institution to build capacity. And what does that, you know, I know you'll have some examples in Florida to, to learn from, but what does that look like? Because when we see these RFPs coming in from some of these federal agencies and we have these, these calls to distribute uh, the, the research funding over various institution types with, that come in at different places, what does that look like either from a funder point of view and what should they be funding and, and how can they meet institutions where they are so to really spur these innovations, but not have these calls for funding that doesn't resonate with the landscape? Absolutely. You are filling in as well? Could not agree with you more. Uh, we're deliberating that right now as we look at the next wave of funding opportunities. Uh, you know, because A, we want to make sure that those resources are really directed towards the institutions that uh, need them most and, and that we feel that this program uh, it was really intended to support. Uh, and, and then in doing so, though, one of the things that this is a very critical lesson learned for us. So, you know, it's great to have resources, but you really have to think through how those resources are implemented. Because as you are very aware, because of the national push and so many initiatives, we're finding out that many of the stakeholders, they're inundated. And so it's a real bottleneck uh, operationally, administratively. So you can't just award them stuff and throw funds, right? Because they're, they're swimming in it and, and almost even drowning in it. So you've got to really understand you know, that and work with them to see, hey, what's the best way to utilize those resources? And that just takes engagement and understanding. Yeah, this is really important work as, you know, nationally as we build um, this infrastructure to have, you know, not only more uh, diverse researchers at this um, table, we'll say, but also to, to have us really play an important part from the size. And somebody put a question in the chat, they said, do you collaborate with clinical researchers that access genomic and or clinical data obtained from research for health disparities? I think they want to kind of get down with what you're doing. Absolutely. Yeah. No, one of the things that we're, you know, really proud of is, you know, the, uh, the academic and industrial partnerships that we have. And so we work with a number of academic medical centers uh, and, you know, we have data use agreements with them. And so, 
you know, we access that data and we're developing AI ML algorithms, uh, again, to do things like predict, uh, you know, risk, you know, outcome, therapeutic response, 30 day readmission, uh, you know, risk for that. And these are just critical things, right? Because they help us uh, address health disparities. Wonderful. When we address health disparities, it makes health care better for everyone Absolutely. and for the future generations. So Absolutely. Dr. Carlisle, I think on, on the words of one of our attendees, thank you for this presentation and the work that you both do. Well, I'm going to give it to Dr. Carlisle that Dr. Carlisle does for the community, for the nation, and, and really the world at large. So really just to, just to keep at it. And thank, thank you, you so much for all of this important work. Thank you so much. And thank you to the audience. Uh, thank you for having me, Dr. Washington. It truly has been a pleasure. Uh, and again, and this just continues to inspire me and, and you know, reaffirm how important this space is. And, and you know, um, I, double, I double down on my commitment. Thank you. Fantastic. All Thanks, right. everybody, for joining us today. We'll see you in a few weeks. All right. Bye -bye. Have a great day.